So, hi, uh, I'm Antti, and uh, today, as you can see, I will be talking about the rump kernels and uh, why and how we got here. This is a, a project I've been working on for close to eight years now, so there's a lot of history and uh, a lot of things didn't go quite how we planned. And uh, the interesting part about working on something so long is that it eventually starts solving problems which you never foresaw the project to solve from the beginning. So that's the reason I'm uh, also concentrating on the history in addition to giving just an introduction. So uh, let's get started. This is the New Directions in Operating Systems conference. So why am I talking at this conference? How does, how does the subject relate to the, to the or, or how does my, my subject relate to the subject of the conference? So there's uh, three motivations I came up with. So uh, the first one is that uh, you're building something and uh, you want to run an application and maybe you don't, you don't need a full operating system for it. So uh, an operating system can be heavy, it can be clunky. If you don't need it, why use it? But still, for the application to actually work, which is nice, you have to have a certain set of drivers. You know, applications depend on if, it's a, if it uses the network, it depends on the TCP IP stack and so forth. So we need those drivers from somewhere. Uh, the second thing is that we simply want to build a better operating system. So maybe we are in a situation where we still need an operating system. We want to do some sort of a, uh, resource management or, or have kind of a holistic view of the sy system. And uh, uh, even today, I think there are plenty of talks on secure operating systems. So this seems to be an important topic. And uh, the third motivation is this uh, new trend of the operating system gets in the way. So uh, if you look at a lot of the recent work, it's about bypassing, bypassing the operating system kernel when you, when you want to do I.O. processing like user space networking or user space storage stacks. So those are the three motivations. So for the first half of my talk, I'll tell you about what an operating system is. Well, actually, hopefully it won't take quite half of the talk since I assume most people know what an operating system is, but I'll just go over the subject very quickly from my perspective and, and kind of what the definition of an operating system in the context of my talk is. So an operating system is mostly made up of drivers. These are the things I mentioned already, which enable applications to run. Uh, uh, the problem with them is these days you need so many of them. So you need anywhere from 100,000 to a million lines of code worth of drivers to, to successfully run applications. And uh, also all lines of code are not created equal. So uh, when I say drivers, uh, I can mean, for example, the networking stack, or I can mean file system drivers or, or device drivers, and all of these have sort of different requirements. So if you consider, for example, a file system driver, you have to write every line of code so that if, if, if the system crashes while that line of code is being executed, your file system doesn't get curdled, which is a completely different requirement from networking, where if your system crashes during packet processing, then well, at least people's data don't get lost. So drivers can be difficult, and they, they can be difficult to get right. You know how, how big modern file system drivers are. There are hundreds of thousands of lines of code, so you, you can't feasibly just sit down and write one. Or you can, but then it won't work. So there's an there's a old joke I always say, that anyone can write a TCP IP stack in a weekend. No problem, but then, then when you plug it on the internet, then you run into trouble. So uh, that's what makes drivers difficult. So in addition to drivers, an operating system is, is made up of a optional goop, which more or less depends on the operating system in question. Uh, for example, or let, let's, let's, let's do it this way. So drivers are the things which 
enable operating systems to run and the optional goop is things which, which sorry, drivers are the things which enable applications to run and the optional goop is the things which usually prevents applications from stepping on each other or, or hogging all of the resources and so forth. So if you have just one application running in your operating system, then this kind of stuff is usually not very necessary. And uh, depending on the system, this, this amount of optional goop can be, let's say, from a, you know, just shake it out of the, uh, out of the, 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 the well, whatever the idiom is in English, uh, but it can be anywhere from a thousand to, let's say, a hundred thousand lines of code. So, yeah. So now we have a graphic which is not visible, apparently. Uh, but here, here we have one operating system. I'll just go through this quickly. So this is attempting to de depict the monolithic kernel. You know, there's a huge clunk of garbage at the bottom, and then there's some applications running on the top, and then it's crashing and burning. Uh, then here we have a, a, a mo monolithic microkernel, where you have one big server, and uh, this is actually an approach which is fairly close to virtualization, if you think about it. There, there are some differences, but here, for example, this is kind of modeled after uh, Lights, which was 4.4 BSD running on top of Mac, and you have kind of drivers everywhere, and then you have one servers, and the, and the applications are kind of running in a schizophrenic manner, both on the server and the kernel. Anyway, drivers, there's two. Here's a, uh, uh, what's this, a uh, multi-server microkernel. So we have uh, usually a driver which is isolated in its own server, and then we have some kernel box here, and then we have these invisible arrows, and uh, we have the applications again running there. Uh, so this is uh, what's uh, being called a multi-kernel, so you have one stack per core and they somehow communicate asynchronously and again we have drivers somewhere. And finally we have uh, what's being called a unikernel now which is uh, pretty much uh, just a single stack with all the drivers and the application bundled together and this is exactly the case where you don't really sort of have an operating system, you just have an application but you still need the drivers for the application to work. Okay, so uh, let's wrap around to the motivations of this talk and why I spent such a long time showing invisible arrows. So uh, this monolithic red kernel box thing is the place where most of the drivers these days are hidden. They're implemented for monolithic operating systems and uh, they're kind of tied in there and if we, uh, we want to build these other structures, we want to develop these other structures quickly in an accelerated fashion without having to sit down and write a million lines of driver code and actually have that driver code also work, then we need some way to get drivers into these new systems. Now, how do we do that? Well, there can technically be two approaches. So the first one is really that we sit down and write them from scratch. That's uh, Sometimes not be feasible. Sometimes I think it's actually a somewhat good idea to at least try it. You might fail, but you might gain some new insight when you really attempt to simplify things. And uh, simplification is really the key. And the other option is to port the drivers, but porting, and by porting I mean you take the original code, then you then you uh, hack it a bit so that it runs in your new environment but doesn't run in the old environment anymore. Now that creates a huge maintenance burden because now any updates or, or you're incompatible with the old code base, code base so any updates will, uh, will be manual work. Yeah, so get, get rid of complexity but I mean we still need to want to run something, we don't just want to have a simple application which does nothing because that's not very useful. Okay, so get to the second half of the talk. What is a rump kernel? <coughs> so here's a, here's a very simplified picture of a rump kernel. Uh, 
this says ramp kernel, and these are all the drivers that the ramp kernel can provide. It can provide file system drivers, TCP IP drivers, device drivers, and uh, also seems, seems insignificant, but actually very important, provide system call handler drivers so you can run existing applications. A ramp kernel runs on top of a high-level hypercall interface, which uh, is pretty much the simplest interface we figured out on top of which you can run run drivers. It's uh, it's uh, implemented, or this hypercall interface is implemented for for each platform separately. Each platform can be, for example, a user space or or bare metal or or a cloud hypervisor. The implementation of this interface is usually in the order of uh, uh, a thousand lines of code, so it's it's uh, fairly simple. And uh, on top of the stack, we have the callers, which uh, actually use the drivers. For example, applications, or uh, if you're building a microkernel, they can be the servers, or, or uh, so forth. Okay, so then the big question, why is it called a rump kernel? Uh, so if you look up the word rump in a dictionary, and also if you look up the correct definition, you'll find this. Small or inferior remnant or offshoot, especially a group, as in a parliament, carrying on in the name of the original body after the departure or expulsion of a large number of, it, of its members. So maybe some people are already seeing where this is going. So we do some string substitution. So a rump kernel is a blah, 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 blah. A monolithic operating system kernel carrying on the name of the original body after the departure or expulsion of a large number of its subsystems. Great, so now we know. <clears throat> so in other words, a ramp kernel doesn't provide drivers. It, it, uh, sorry, it does, it does provide drivers, it doesn't provide most of the stuff that a that, uh, monolithic kernel would. For example, it doesn't provide threads, a scheduler, pro, uh, binary execution support, to virtual memory, and it doesn't require the emulation of, of, a, of a privileged mode, or it doesn't require interrupts. Now, this uh, lack of things has, uh, has uh, two impacts. First of all, since, since there's very little requirements on the platform we run the RUMP kernel on, for example, no need for virtual memory or, or, or uh, privileged mode, which, which uh, for example, virtual memory, if you want to run in user space, you can emulate it with some MMAP hacks or whatever, but it's very clunky. It's not very convenient. The same for interrupts, you can use signals if you want to, but it's not very convenient. So uh, the first advantage of this uh, rumping stuff or leaving stuff out is that you can pretty much run on any platform. The second is that since, uh, for example, it doesn't provide a scheduler, when you run the drivers in a rump kernel, you actually run them uh, on top of your host platform's uh, threading system, so it integrates very tightly, so you don't run into the situation where you schedule a scheduler to virtualize something, you just schedule something. Okay, so, so that didn't, uh, or that explained what the RAMP kernel is, but I didn't answer the question, where do the drivers come from, do they magically fall from the air? So, uh, uh, let's, if, if we consider the case of a monolithic kernel, we take uh, take the code base and then we just try to compile it without, for example, uh, building in the virtual memory subsystem, uh, things will fail. So uh, eventually over time, like I said, this is almost eight years old now, uh, the, the NetBSD kernel code base was converted to something which I call an any kernel, which uh, allows this type of uh, componentization where you just pick the things you want. Well, I won't go into detail on that, but you can, for example, read the commit logs. It was something in the order of uh, a few thousand commits. So now let's go back to the original, uh, uh, or, or the first figure I showed, I mean the first figure without the invisible arrows. And this is kind of uh, the same figure, except now I added some complexity here. So. 
So, uh, but now you know what a ramp kernel is, so this should be easy to parse. So we have the same thread throughout the, sing uh, the, the same thread throughout the entire stack, which is great. We still have the ramp kernel in the middle. Magically, some glue code box appeared here, but uh, we don't have to worry about that. This is just because we don't have a scheduler, we don't have virtual memory, we need a small amount of glue code. Now, if you want to use ramp kernels, you don't need to worry about that box, for example, at all. Uh, we still have the hypercall interface uh, and, and the implementation. Like I said, it's around a thousand lines of code to implement it. We have a bunch of platforms we can run on. And then, optionally, on top of the ramp kernel, we, we can put a libc, it's not necessary. And if we put a libc, we can actually run most of the standard POSIX applications. Now this part, again, not necessary. And uh, as you can see from this great uh, squiggly stuff graphic on the, on the right, uh, pretty much all of this comes unmodified from NetBSD. So that's really the key, you can take any vintage of the NetBSD source tree and just operate it in this mode. So we move on to the third part of the talk, which is the, the history lesson, which is, uh, can be fairly interesting. So this started back in 2007. I was uh, doing some user space file system development and I noticed it was kind of neat because it was a billion times easier than trying to do uh, file system driver development using a virtual machine. Now, uh, again, a brilliant graphic. So what I essentially wanted to do was to take the kernel file system driver. I mean, user space file system frameworks are great because they enable you running uh, file system drivers in user space, but, I mean, for example, Fuse, but they don't allow running kernel file system drivers in user space, so I couldn't actually develop, uh, debug them in user space. So uh, this was one of those, well, how hard can it be to make this thing run here? I mean, a ker kernel is essentially user space with uh, different names, at least a monolithic. <laughs> no, don't laugh, that's actually true. You know, the, the enter or mutex lock has a slightly different name, memory allocation has a slightly different name, but it's really the same thing. If you start to think about it, you wonder, like, why do we have two versions of this same code? Well, anyway, so uh, building some ad hoc shims and, you know, some emulation and uh, uh, it took, took uh, I don't know, a week or two to get it working. So it wasn't really that difficult. But the problem, actually, there are two problems with this, uh, this diagram. The first one is really this ad hoc stuff. So my only requirement was that I'm not allowed to touch the file system driver at all. That has to be completely unmodified. I actually wanted to debug it in user space, so I didn't allow myself to touch it. Touch it. But everything else which, which the driver required to run was kind of developed in an ad hoc fashion. Uh, so it wasn't maintainable. I mean, someone would change something else in the kernel outside the file system and then my shims would break. Okay, so it, it, I couldn't live with it. And uh, the second problem with this figure is that actually you can't run the file system driver standalone because a lot of the logic of how the file system works is actually here, here in the host kernel in the system calls. For example, path name resolution. So if you want to resolve slash foo slash bar, you actually need both this thing and, uh, and that thing. So that was a second problem. So uh, the second problem was addressed by this brilliant, uh, brilliant, brilliant layer called the uh, UKFS, or, or uh, I think it stood for user kernel file system, which was just essentially a re-implementation of the, the system calls and the VFS layer, which allowed us to, or yeah, allowed us to run a standalone user space stack without depending on the host kernel uh, user space file system framework. And, uh, well, this was, uh, it worked, kinda, but there was again the, the thing that 
there's a lot of corner cases in this code. You know, you resolve forwards, then you put some dot dots and symbolic links and all kinds of things in the path name, and then suddenly it doesn't work anymore. So, uh, but it was an attempt. And uh, like the question there says, the thing or the lesson really learned from this is that you can try to simplify it, but uh, it, it can fail. Uh, the question, why didn't I just then, then uh, try to, from the previous slide, just try to port the uh, system calls and, and uh, VFS operations into user space then? Well, it wasn't obvious how to do it back then, and this seems like a good idea, but then it actually turned out to be a bad idea. So then we just saw that this talk wouldn't take five hours. We fast forward to 2011, and uh, pretty much the any kernel had been figured out, so, so uh, we had the rump kernel nicely isolated. The ad hoc shims are gone. It's now maintainable, etc., etc. We kind of have a hypercall interface. Uh, we can sort of run on any user space platform. And uh, one important thing, it's more or less production quality now. It's used for actually testing some of NetBSD's kernel drivers because it's much more convenient to do kernel testing in, in user space because if you crash then you know, your test, test run just continues. Uh, so these were kind of uh, mutually contributing things which uh, allowed, uh, I mean, it had to be production quality to allow testing and because testing was done using it, then it was even more production quality. So one thing you can notice from this figure is there's no, uh, no libc on top yet. Uh, so yeah, things ran in user space only this time. So then there's something I wrote somewhere around the end of 2011, 2012, uh, which you can all read when you watch the video. Uh, but essentially the idea was that we can use this to enable the things which I talked about in the motivations. So uh, yeah, so in step three we ran on user space, but it wasn't obvious how to do things except on NetBSD. So uh, how to, and I started getting a lot of emails, like you have this TCP IP stack which runs in user space, could I perhaps run it on Linux? And then it was a very long email, and then writing these emails got tiring, so then we did a script for it, which is again kind of simple, but then when we started supporting all of the linkers and all of the architectures and all of the compilers and all of the different, things which are different, then it got a bit more complicated. But this is an important step because it built into the next phase, which is the beyond POSIX phase, where we could run actually beyond user space. We could run on bare metal, we could run on, on different things. And actually this was my first, first attempt at beyond POSIX. It was uh, compiling the drivers to JavaScript and then running them in a browser. And as you can see, I'm debugging the file system driver with Firebug, which is an experience no one should have to live without. <laughs> but the problem with this was that the CG JavaScript compiler I used was too good. It actually emulated POSIX, so I was still kind of running on POSIX. Okay, so, Whoa. so the next attempt was, uh, okay, the Linux kernel is decidedly not, not POSIX, so let's plug these drivers into the Linux kernel. And uh, yeah, that sort of works. So here's a D message of me using the, the NetBSD TCP IP stack in the Linux kernel to fetch a web page. Well, I don't know. It, it again wasn't particularly useful, but at least it was a decidedly non-POSIX platform. Now, the problem with this was that like I said in the beginning, the kernel is really just POSIX with different names. So again, it wasn't really that interesting. So uh, we move here, which is, uh, you can see in the picture, RAMP kernels running on a few laptops I had lying around and, and uh, doing, uh, doing, again, TCP IP. For example, some reason, for some reason, fetching a web page is a very interesting demo. And uh, bare metal is now very decidedly not POSIX. 
And uh, here I started being a bit satisfied that we can actually run rump kernels anywhere. Like this was the proof of the pudding. There's actually one intermediate step I should mention before, before bare metal happened. There was a, a port to run out about the Zen hypervisor. And uh, the uh, Zen comes with a thing called mini OS, which is kind of a uh, not so POSIX POSIX thing, which, uh, which was kind of an important stepping stone into getting bare metal because it helped us really understand how, uh, how to do scheduling and how to do thing like, things like that. Well, okay, but anyway, now the RAMP kernels ran pretty much anywhere, and then something pretty amazing happened. And I guess I can say that because it wasn't my idea. So uh, we got, got the RAMP kernel running on top of the Zen hypervisor, and then, uh, then people came to me and said that, yeah, now we have this thing running, so, so uh, could we just put a libc on top of it? You know, then we could run applications on it. Then I was like, no, 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 you don't understand. See, this is a romp kernel. This doesn't run applications. And then a bit of arguing, no, no, but you know, the, we have the system calls there, a libc could just work. And, and uh, then I was, no, 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 no. Oh, that's actually a brilliant idea. Let's do it. So a bit of hacking, mostly dealing with stupid uh, build systems. Okay, that's redundant. There isn't a non-stupid build system. But anyway, we took the NetBSD libc, we threw the system call traps out, just didn't build them in. We replaced them with calls to the ROM kernel, and then everything magically worked. And uh, I believe there's a talk later today about demoing this stuff, so if you're interested, then make sure you're not drinking the unlimited coffee. Okay, uh, final half. Uh, I forgot to which half that was, but conclusions. Uh, so I skipped the technical details. Uh, if you want to find them, there's a book at, at that address. It's uh, the first edition of the book. It's complete, but it was completed around step three and a half, so a lot of the stuff which happened then is, is missing. I'm working on a second edition. It's not ready yet, but hopefully it will be someday. And uh, like the first one, it will be available as a free PDF for, to download, and uh, I'm also hoping to offer it as a printed version in case uh, someone doesn't like using LPR, so if someone has a has good knowledge of a publisher which allows selling small volumes of uh, otherwise freely available PDF, let me know. Uh, some links, because they're mandatory, well, pretty much the only one you need to remember is the first one, rumpkernel.org, which is not that hard to remember, hopefully. All of this is, of course, open source in BSD license. There's a wiki, there's a mailing list, there's a IRC channel, and... Uh, and uh, a Twitter account, apparently, and uh, a bunch of other stuff. <coughs> so, uh, yeah, so getting on to my conclusions and kind of uh, the reason I'm here talking is uh, hopefully we will have some, some better structures in operating systems. Hopefully we will manage to build systems where you don't need an operating system at all, but to do so, we actually need drivers and uh, simplify but retain the, the necessary complexity to give a very boring train analogy from this morning. I was stuck at Camden Town and uh, apparently the metro station at Camden Town, I mean the line goes somehow very weird. It splits and combines and splits and combines and splits and combines and I have no idea what was happening and I was running around in the platform. So I think that kind of building, uh, building metro lines which split and combine is unnecessary complexity. However, the train of course to give a very cliche analogy is necessary complexity because otherwise I would have had to walk. So. so that's my conclusion. Throw out the rubbish stuff and retain the necessary complexity. But you know, don't build your trains from scratch. That's uh, time consuming. So this is the slogan I came up for the project. So thank you, questions?
So the question was if I can give an example of an application where it makes sense to use a RAMP kernel. Well, for example, if you're building an embedded system and you don't want to build your embedded system around the LOS because the, well, okay, Linux, uh, because it's, uh, it's big, it contains unnecessary complexity. Let's say you want to target a sort of microcontroller-ish environment. I mean, the, the thing, thing about RAM kernels really is that they're only as good as the, the drivers where they came from. And I mean, they don't ma magically shrink into really tiny microcontrollers and then, then they don't do anything that the original system didn't do. But I mean, anything where you just need a, need a driver.